right, man. Well, welcome to the fifth week of our Mr. and Mrs. Better Half series, How to Win a Woman, How to Keep a Man. How many of you would say this, man? Okay, this series has really helped my marriage. How many of you would say that? Okay, cool. Maybe a few, and you got two people. Okay, I'm glad that, you know we built this church for you. Um, how many of you would say they're like, man, this this. I'm not married in here, I'm, I'm, I'm single or I'm single again, but man, this, this series has really helped equip me on my future marriage. I'm sure it's done that for you. It's been awesome for, for my wife and I's marriage, man. I'll say this, every time the marriage series comes around in the church, it's like my marriage gets really good, you know, because I'm like, oh yeah, I got to be a good husband, <laughs> you know what I mean? And so it's awesome seeing you here. I'm excited about next week because next week we start a new series called No other name. The past two series that we've done, we've done Unqualified, we've done Mr. and Mrs. Better Half. These have really been kind of horizontal. In your walk with God, you always, you have your horizontal aspect, your relationships here on this planet, but then you also have your relationship with God, your vertical. And I'll say this, this next week, man, we're really going vertical and it's going to be amazing. And it's really going to equip us and empower us to, to take not only our walk with God deeper, but to the next level. And so, I'll say this, you know, as we're starting this church, we're eight weeks old now, and uh, it, it's awesome, man. We've, we've already seen just being eight weeks old an impact in this community, and it's really, really cool to see. And I've had people come up to me, and they're like, Marco, we love what's going on at Vibrant Church. What can we do to, to be a part of this? What can we do to help? And to that, I'll say this, the best thing that you can do is to fill a row. That's the best thing you can do. You see your row, like take a look down your row. Okay, I'm going to fill. Mine's already full. I'm going to fill another one so that we have to keep adding seats in here uh, for people to hear about Jesus Christ. So that is the best way. Get the word out, man. Share what we're doing on social media um, and, and let people know that we are here and that we want to help people grow a vibrant relationship with God. So, again, we're excited about this series coming up um, no other name. Well, in week one of Mr. and Mrs. Better Half, we made the commitment to seek God, and we're going to grab this, the, the hand of our spouse, our number two, and we're going to seek our number one. And then in week two, we talked about fighting fair. Again, don't throw your wife's brownies in the trash. You're going to get in trouble for that. Week three is, is have fun, man. Have fun in your marriage. And then week four, last week, we made the commitment to stay pure. We don't want any dog poop in our brownies. We talked about that last week for those of you who are here. You don't want dog poop in your brownies, not even just a little bit. And this week, we're making the commitment to never give up. We never give up. And I want to start off today by asking our married people a question, and the question is this, if you're married in here. How many of you would say that you married someone that is different than you? Raise your hand. Yeah. <laughs> no. uh, yeah. Whether big or small, they're a little bit opposite of who you are. See, what is interesting is people say that when you're dating, opposites attract. But then statistics show that once you're married, opposites attack. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Man, when we're dating, we have so much in common, you know. And you get married, it's like, I hate that about them. You know, it, it's the, the opposites attack once you get married. See, a matter of fact, let me, let me get a survey real quick. If you're married in here, how many of you are the punctual on time, a little OCD, borderline OCD one? Okay, okay. Okay. Um, how many of you um, would say that you're a little bit of the more kind of creative, the more chill, the more kind of go with the flow one in your marriage? No, 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 take your time, raise your hand, it's okay, just kind of chill, easy going, okay? Um, how many of you are the planner in your marriage? Okay, right there, right there. You know, it's like when you're going on a trip, you're planning everything all the way down to the bathroom breaks. If we make it to this city... This is where we'll use the restroom. If not, if you got to go to the restroom before we get here, I'm sorry, you're going to have to go to sleep. You know what I mean? It's like, that, that's, that's you. Okay. How many of you are kind of the, like, when it comes to like planning a trip, you're kind of just like spin the bottle type, like, boop, oh, oh, it's pointing that direction. Okay, here we go. You know, anybody in there like that? Okay. Just kind of go with the flow. Kind of just whatever direction, man, we'll, we'll just go that way. It's going to be great. It's just an adventure. 
How many of you, when it comes to money, how many of you are the saver? Anybody the saver in here? Money's for security. Let's stockpile it in case of a catastrophe. Okay. Um, how about this one? How many of y'all are the spenders? Hey, man, money's for a good time. Let's go blow this thing. Hey, for all of our spenders in here, our offering boxes are located right in the back. I, I, uh, just kind of a heads up there. But, uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> See, the good news is many times, and this is good news, the good news is many times opposites attract. That's good news in dating, that's good news in marriage, but we're not the same, and that's okay because of this. God often brings those that are different together. If both spouses are the same, then one is unnecessary. Again, God often brings those that are different together, but check this out. Though Satan would like to twist it and make you think that you have nothing in common with your spouse, the reality is is you have more in common than you realize. You're just different, and that's a good thing. That's not a thing to attack about. That's an actual thing to celebrate about. But how many of y'all know that's a little bit harder to, to do than it is to say? It's like, yeah, Mark, you can say that all you want to, but my, my spouse say crazy. You know what I mean? No. God brings those that are different together. That's why today we're going to make the commitment that though we're different, we're never going to give up on each other. But this is what I want you to know today up front. I got to be up front with you. I'm going to bring the heat today. Come on, bring it. Well, <laughs> everybody just went, uh-oh. I'm going to bring the heat today. And as I do, please know that I'm not talking about you staying in an abusive marriage where you're a punching bag and you have to hide your bruises. We don't want anybody getting roughed up in this church. That's not what we're talking about. If that's the case, I recommend that you separate, get counseling, and, then, and work, then, get, then work on your marriage. I also want to say this. If you've had a marriage that ended in divorce, I don't want you to feel guilt. Because the chances are you already feel enough guilt. And chances are this. You tried everything in your power to make that marriage work, but you didn't get the support from your spouse to actually make it work. And so I'm here to tell you today this. If that's you, if you've been married before but you're no longer married, there's hope. God is not just a God of a second chance. He's a God of another chance. And that's a common thread through this entire series, that anytime we make mistakes, anytime we mess up, guess what? We serve a God that we can run to. Our heart desire when we're following Jesus isn't to mess up, but many times and sometimes we do. And when we do mess up, it's, God, I turn to you. And that's what we're doing today. God, we're, we're turning to you. See, vibrant church is a place of hope and healing for anyone, no matter what you've been through, no matter what you've been through. See, others of you may be saying this, man, Marco, looking back, I was the one that did a lot of things wrong. Maybe that's you in here, and you're kind of feeling that condemnation. You're feeling that guilt. And you're telling yourself, if I could do it over again, I'd do a lot of things differently. And you carry that weight. And if that's you in here, let me say this. You're forgiven. And maybe you need to hear that. Marco, I'm carrying the weight of a lot of mess-ups in my marriage, in my previous marriage, in my family. And this is what I want you to know. Be free. Be released. Like Busayo was talking about. From this day forward, from this day forward, I'm going to live for God. I'm going to make the the right decisions, new decisions, better decisions, because your future is bright and you are forgiven. And it's with this attitude that we're approaching today. It's with this attitude of grace, of mercy, of living for God, of never giving up that we're approaching today. And I, I want us to forget about the past because we can't change it. God forgives you. How many of you know that? We need a reminder every once in a while. Man, we mess up. We can't change that. We've got to move forward. That's why the Apostle Paul tells us, he says, don't walk the cakewalk. He says this. He says, fight the good fight of faith. I let go of the past so that I can move forward into the future of what God has for my life. 
And that's the context of what we're talking about today. So lay your past at the feet of Jesus. I want to start off today in Matthew 19, 3 through 6. It says this. Some Pharisees came to him, Jesus, to test him. And they asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Now let's pause there for a second so you understand the context here. It's unfortunate But during this time in history, women were viewed more as property than people. Again, it's unfortunate. This is biblical here. The times they were living in, uh, women were treated uh, more like property than people. And at this time, a man could basically look at his wife and say, "I I don't want you anymore. I don't want to be married to you anymore. And he would divorce her. That's why the Pharisees ask, is it lawful for any reason for a man to divorce his wife? In this scripture, we see the Pharisees were trying to trap Jesus. They wanted to see what his standard was regarding this topic. But what's cool about Jesus when it comes to standard, I remember being a youth pastor, you know, and I have these teenagers come up to me and stuff. And even when I wasn't a youth pastor and I was an associate pastor, they'd come up to me and be like, so Marco, what's the line when it comes to my girlfriend? You know, what's the line when it comes to my boyfriend? How many of you know when they're coming up asking for the line, they've already probably jacked up, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and they come up to me and they'd be like, okay, so like, so Marco, what's, what's the line in this thing, you know? And uh, I'd be like, and my, my response was, if you're asking where the line is, you're asking the wrong question. The question is, am I pleasing God with my lifestyle? And I'm like, uh, I need to repent, you know? <laughs> and so the cool thing about Jesus is this. Anytime there's a standard, he always takes that standard and he goes, he sets that standard at another level. And the Pharisees are looking at him and they're going, is it lawful for any reason to divorce? Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason? And Jesus is saying, man, basically, you're asking the wrong question. We've got to take the standard up to a whole new level here. And let me talk to those who are dating or maybe dating or you're single in here. Maybe one day you want to date. At any time, you have to lower your moral standard to start or maintain a dating relationship. It's not what God wants for your life. Anytime you have to lower your standard to enter into a dating relationship or maintain a dating relationship, that is not God's will for your life. Again, Jesus has a high standard. Check this out. Matthew 19, 4 through through 6. It says, haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother, and check this out, and be united to his wife. And the two will become one. Say one with me. The two will become one one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Now, in this scripture, God is not saying you lose your personality as an individual or you lose your uniqueness as an individual when you get married. But what he is saying is this. In God's eyes, when you get married, there's two individuals that become one. They're seamless. There's, they're, if you were to weld these two together, there would be no like visible weld. They're, it's seamless. It's like this. It's like taking two pieces of paper, boom, super gluing them together all over the cracks and all over and everything, like every single inch of the paper being super glued together. And then you come in and you try to separate those two pieces of paper. Guess what? You can't do it. If you go in and you try to, to, to separate these two super glued pieces of paper together, guess what's going to happen? You're going to rip off a little bit of that other piece of the paper when you're trying to separate those two things. You're going to get a little bit of this piece of the paper, a little bit of this piece of paper when you're trying to separate those. That's why divorce hurts so bad. And as your pastor, I say that to you because I love you and I care for you. And there's people in here, again, that have experienced divorce, and you know how painful it is. And then there's others of you in here, you were a child of your parents, and your parents got divorced. And you realize the pain and the hurt and the agony of that. You know the pain of it. Why is it painful? Because you can't unone what God has made one. 
You can't unwind what God has made one. For our single people in here, that's why dating people that have the same core beliefs about God, about church, and about life is so important. Because once you say, I do, you did. I told you I was going to bring the heat today. (laughs) It's the Bible. We value the Bible at Vibrant Church. We've got to speak the Bible. We've got to speak the truth. But we've got to speak it in love. And we have to let you know that, man, if there's been mistakes there, you're forgiven. We move forward. We move on. That's why it's so important if you're dating and you're single, man, that you, you, you connect spiritually like we were talking about in week two. You connect spiritually. Then you connect, do we agree about the same thing spiritually? Then, it, then it's, you connect emotionally. What, do our personalities line up together? And then when you get married, you connect body to body. Again, you can't unwind what God has made one. See, the problem in our society many times is that people don't understand what marriage is. We kind of we go in this thing like, okay, everybody's doing it, you know what I mean? Like, uh, but I, I'm going to get married because I guess it's the next step in life, but I don't really know what I'm getting into. And they think that marriage is an agreement or a contract based on happiness. All of our married people just laughed at that internally. Ha, 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 happiness, yes, okay. My wife, in her wisdom, she said one day, she goes, you know, Marco, uh, I got married because I, wanna be ha- I wanted to be happy. But then I, I got married and I learned the secret to having a great marriage is to make you happy, to make the other person happy. It's to outserve one another. You know? so, we, so we get into marriage, and there's nothing wrong with that. You get into, go into marriage because you want to be happy. I mean, being married is great. But you realize, man, it can't be based on happiness. It can't be based on a contract. Check this out. Marriage is a covenant, not a contract. What's the difference? What's a covenant? That's not a very popular word in our culture today, but it's very biblical. What's the difference between a covenant and a contract? A contract is based on mutual distrust. A covenant is based on mutual commitment. Contract, you go and you buy a home you, you're buying it from somebody you probably don't know, so it's like, okay, we got to have a contract agreement here that if you don't live up to what you say, then I have legal right to take action. But a covenant is based on mutual commitment. Oh, the blessings of planting a church next to the railroad track. <laughs> For those of you who are listening online, we just had a train go by our church. A contract limits my responsibility and it increases my rights. It says, I trust you as far as you can perform. If you don't perform to meet my expectations, then I'm chunking the deuce. I'm out. <laughs> Unfortunately, many people enter marriage with this mentality. As long as you, com- you perform, then I'm committed. And as long as someone better doesn't come along in my life, then I'm committed. But as soon as you don't perform or as soon as somebody better comes along, then I'm out. But marriage isn't a contract in the eyes of God. It's a covenant. A covenant is a permanent relationship. A covenant is a permanent relationship. God is a covenantal God. And God makes relationships that are permanent. In fact, the Hebrew word for covenant used in the Bible is barith. That's a little bit of Hispanic, a little bit of Hebrew. Barith. 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 I'm half, yeah, I got to roll that R. (laughs) And the word bereath, it literally means this. It means to cut. How does to cut mean covenant? Well, if you take this back to biblical times, whenever two people would make a covenant, they would take a bull and they would cut it in half. And then they would take those two pieces of bull And they would walk around those bulls, each piece of the bull, seven times. They would circle around each piece seven times. And after they walked around them seven times, they would look at each other and say, if I break my covenant with you, may what happened to this bull happen to me. Bereath. To cut. It's covenant. Covenant is a permanent covenant. Relationships. See, many times in the Old Testament, those that were getting married, there would be a representative of God and, and this man and this woman. Again, we believe in the Bible. We believe that, man, that, that marriage is between one woman and one man. And this one woman and one man would come together and that representative of God 
uh, would stand between them, and he would actually take a blade or, or some resource to cut with, and he would cut the man's ha- uh, hand, and then he would take that woman's hand, and he would cut her hand, and then he would put them together like that. And after he joined them together, he would take a piece of rope and wrap that around them, signifying in that moment that those open wounds came together and now they both have the same blood running through them because they are one. That's what happened. That's why we never give up. We never give up. See, what God has joined together, let no one separate. We don't unone what God made one. But Marco, my marriage is so difficult. It's painful. I'm not happy. Happy, happy. I don't trust my spouse. She's not this. He's not that. I don't love her anymore. I don't love him anymore. To get divorced because you run out of love is like selling your car because you ran out of gas. To get divorced because you ran out of love is like selling your car because you ran out of gas. When you run out of gas, what do you do? You do what you haul tail, like on that one mile left on your little thing. You're like, ah, ah, you're pulling in the gas station. Ah, you're just sliding in there. You're like, I got to get gas in my car. And then you park, and you're like, oh, I made it. Same thing happens whenever we feel like we run out of love in our marriage. We do whatever it takes. We get in emergency mode. I'm not feeling love right now. Okay, I am not giving Satan a foothold in my marriage. I'm going to do whatever it takes to get in love again. That's why we're doing a daytime challenge at Vibrant Church. Come on, somebody, with a daytime challenge. For those of you who have been repping on social media, that's what's up, man. My wife and I did week two of our daytime challenge, had an awesome breakfast date yesterday morning. And uh, if you're not taking a part of it, man, join us this, this third week. Take your spouse out on a date and to have some fun together. Restore that love in that marriage through connecting. But Marco, I don't have any more love to give. To be honest with you, I'm fed up. I don't even want to attempt what you're talking about. That's when the commitment in week one to seek God happens. See, when you seek God... God says this. Again, let's back up. Marco, I don't feel like loving my spouse. I, I don't, I'm fed up. I don't have it in me to do it anymore. Guess what the Bible says? The Bible says that God is love. So that's whenever we seek God. We seek him with all of our heart. God, i got to be honest with you right now. I know this is a covenantal agreement with you or a covenant with you um, that I made with my spouse when I got married, but I'm out of love, God. And that's when God says, hey, come to me. Seek me because I am love, and I will fill you with love when you don't feel like it to love your spouse. And all of a sudden, guess what happens? You seek God, and God begins to love through you. Hey, that same principle applies to your kids as well. Oh, man, my kids, they are whew, they're crazy, man. They're walking into their teenage years. I remember sitting down with parents, and they're like, what happened to my teen? What happened to my kid? I'm like, Hey, don't worry, I got about six of them running around here on Wednesday night. You know what I mean? I know, they're crazy. But God says this, God says, I am love, and then when you seek me, I will pour my love through you. See, when you get married, having difficulties in that marriage is not if, but when. And at some point, things will get difficult and challenging. When things get difficult, that's when you let God do what you don't have the strength to do. So let me answer this question. What do you do when you've been seeking God, but you're not seeing any progress? This is what you do. Remember the principles of sowing and reaping. Galatians 6, 7 through 9, it says, Do not be deceived. God cannot mock, cannot be mocked. A man reaps, a person, that's gender inclusive, a person reaps what he sows, and whatever, whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. That's why we talked about staying pure. When we sow into the flesh, guess what? We sow into sin. We sow into the flesh. That's why we made the commitment to stay pure. But, man, we're going to sow into the spirit. We're going to seek God. And then it goes on to say this. Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest If we do not give up. Say this with me. Say, we do not give up. We never give up. 
The Bible says, you will reap a harvest if you never give up. So today I want to give you two principles of sowing and reaping in your marriage as we continue today. The first one is this, you reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. Culture says today it's karma. God was way before karma ever existed. That came in like 2,000 years ago. God has, when he created this planet, he created sowing and reaping. It's called sowing and reaping. Number one, you reap what you sow. If you plant an apple seed in the ground, are you going to get an orange? No, you're not going to get an If you smile at someone, what's more likely going to happen? You're going to get a smile back. If you're driving down the I-35 in traffic and someone flips you off, what you going to do? <laughs> you going to pray for them, right? <laughs> no, I know some of y'all. <laughs> you're going to get angry back in marriage if someone shows grace compassion and thoughtfulness what are you more likely to show back grace, compassion, thoughtfulness what about this one if you're constantly critical comparing or negative towards your spouse what are you more likely going to receive back a critical comparing and negative response back. So let me talk to the men for a second. I'm going to talk to the ladies too. I'm not going to leave you out. Men, if you want your wife to blossom, treat her tenderly. Protect her from the storms. Water her with life-giving words. Tend to her with gentle and caring hands. Women, if you want your husband to be your knight in shining armor, Respect him. Respect him. Don't criticize him. Nurture his heart. Speak life-giving words about him in front of his friends. Man, you want a man to love you like a woman? When you're around his friends and he's feeling all macho and you walk up and you be like, baby, you are the men of men. I mean, you are just a man's man. All your friends around here, they ain't got nothing on you, baby. Whew. Can't wait till you get home tonight. Hey, you do that, trust me, your man going to be like, okay, I need to go get some roses. I need to go get a meal. I need to go to the store. Man, that dishwasher going to be full tonight. Okay, you know what I'm saying? Like, we're going to clean the house. We're going to get that vacuum in running. You know, you're going to be dancing with that vacuum. <laughs> to both men and women, if you don't like what you're getting, look at what you've been giving. If you don't like what you're getting, getting. Look at what you've been giving. So number one is you reap what you sow. Number two is this. You reap where you sow. You reap where you sow. If I plant a seed over here and I go over here and I start looking for that plant to come up, is there ever going to be a plant to come up right here of the plant that I sowed? No. You reap where you sow. If I plant all of my energy into my career or hobby, bring in the heat. Is, there going, is that going to create a Mr. and Mrs. Better Half fail-proof marriage? No. You'll probably get an award at work that you really don't care about or anyone else does. You'll probably get better at golf, hunting, video gaming, or gardening, but your marriage will suffer. If I put all of my energy into my kids and become child-centered parents... Where every waking minute is spent planning and taking kids to practice and over here and over there. But you never get to date each other or spend time connecting in conversation. Is that going to create a great marriage? No. Again, God our number one, our spouse our number two, everything else in its right place. See, if we want a Mr. and Mrs. Better Half marriage, we have to give what we want to get. And as we close today, I've got to get real with you. Everybody say, get real. The reality is, is some of you are like, Marco, I hear you, but I'm still not feeling it. I don't feel like being nice. I don't feel like forgiving. I don't feel like showing grace. I don't even feel like praying, to be honest with you. I don't feel like working on it. I don't feel like staying married. I don't feel like it, so I'm not going to do it. A question for you is this. What other area in your life can you do that and get away with it? Well, I don't feel like working, so I'm not going to. Well, have fun starving. 
What do you do? You, you get over your feelings and you go and you get a job. Well, I don't feel like being a parent anymore, so I'm not going to take care of my kids. About a month later, Child Protective Services, what's up? What do you do? Just because you don't feel like it, all of a sudden you start, you get over those feelings and you parent. Well, I don't feel like paying my taxes, so I'm not going to pay them anymore. Is that going to work? Not for long. So what's the right thing to do? It's to pay your taxes. How does this apply to my marriage or future marriage? When I say that we never give up, check this out. I'm not saying we just hold on for dear life and we fake it till we make it. That, man, we just act like everything's pretty. I mean, you know, life is so not an Instagram post. Life's more like Facebook Live, yo. I'm telling you. You walk around the camp, it's shaky, it's unstable. There's no, like, sound equal, you know, but that Instagram... You know, it's, that is not the reality of what life is like. That's why we have to make the commitment that no matter how ugly my marriage is, no matter how pretty it is, no matter what it looks like, I'm never going to give up. I'm going to make the commitment to honor God. So whenever I say never give up today, we're making the commitment to do this. I will never give up on having a God-honoring marriage. We reap what we sow. We reap where we sow. And I'm never going to give up on having a God-honoring marriage. But Marco, we've had some bumps in the roads. So has everyone else. Never give up. Never give up. But Marco, my spouse doesn't even like God. Keep praying for them. Never give up. But Marco, I've... I've hurt my spouse so bad. You don't know how bad I've hurt my spouse. I'm, I'm, I'm shocked that they're even hanging on in this marriage. It's got to be hanging on by a thread. Beg for forgiveness and never give up. Babe, forgive me. I've jacked up. I've messed up. I've made some mistakes. But man, God is speaking to my heart. God is speaking to my heart and I love you. I want to live for God. I want to have an incredible, fail-proof marriage. Humble yourself. Remember this. It's not, it's not who's right in marriage. It's what's right. And that's hard to remember in the heat of the moment, but it's one of the most valuable things that you can put into play of, okay, I've got to set my pride aside right now. I've got to set it aside. I've got to humble myself. I've got to become a servant in my marriage right now. And I've got to do what's right. I've got to bite my tongue. I've got to speak life. Marco, we're so opposite of each other. We don't have anything in common anymore. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. You have more in common than you think you do. And the fact is, it's opposites attract. Because if both of you are the same, one of you is not necessary. But God brings that spouse into your life to complement where you're not good at. And brings the other spouse in your life to compliment where this spouse isn't good. And we have to get to a point where we say, God, no matter what, this marriage is going to honor you. I'm going to celebrate my spouse's difference, differences. That's why on your date times, man, when you're sitting across the table from each other, you're going, hey, I realize, man, that we're a little bit different in this area, but I, I appreciate your differences. I celebrate your differences. You're so good in this. You're so good in that. So seek God together as we close this series. Seek God together. Fight fair. Have fun. Face to face. Side to side. Belly button to belly button. Stay pure. And never give up on having a God-honoring marriage. Father, we worship you today. God, we love you so much. I thank you for every person here every person laying in bed because they got that extra hour of sleep today, God. I pray your blessing over the marriages of Vibrant Church. I pray your blessing over future marriages in Vibrant Church. For those that are hurting, who have been divorced or single again, God, I pray your blessing over them. I pray that they would sense your forgiveness, that they would sense your peace, that they would sense your presence like never before. May this whole entire church, God, be filled with your love and be filled with joy as we close this Mr. and Mrs. Better Half. 
series. And if you're here today and you say, man, I don't have a relationship with God, but I want one. The only way to have a relationship with God is through his son, Jesus Christ. And so this is what I want to do with every head bowed, with every eye closed. I'm going to count to three. And on the count of three, I just want you to raise your hand. If you want a relationship with God, you're like, Marco, I don't have a relationship with God. I want one. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to ask you to come up front or anything like that. I just want you to make that commitment between you and God. So on the count of three, raise your hand. One, two, three. Raise your hand. Okay. Awesome. Again, with every head bowed, every eye closed, if you raised your hand in here or you know in your heart, man, I, I need to get right with God. This is what I want you to say. I want you to say, Father, I come before you today a sinner in need of a Savior. And today, I call out on the name of Jesus to come and bring new life into who I am. From this day forward, I live my life for you. In Jesus' name. And everyone said,